Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and I'm the pastor here. And I got a question for you. You know the song, Come Thou Fount, right? It's classic. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Yes. There's a line in that song that I kind of want to talk about today. And it's the line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh, take and seal it with thy spirit from above. That song, right, was written 265 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Seems like life was so much different back then, right? I can't even relate. <laughs> Wrong. That, that feels like my life right now, right? It's prone to wander, prone to walk off, prone to be easily distracted, to, to not focus, to not stay on task. And what is the subject that I'm walking away from? The songwriter says, God, right? Prone to leave the God I love. You ever feel like you have a hard time listening to God or knowing if that voice is God? Like a two-year-old, right? Wandering away from their parents in the mall. The world is full of bright, shiny distractions. In 2002, it was reported that on average, we experience an interruption every eight minutes. That's about seven or eight an hour. <laughs> that means in an eight hour workday, that's 60 distractions. And if it takes you uh, five minutes to get through the distraction, and then maybe another 15 minutes to really get back on task, that means you're never really concentrating very well. Interruptions define our lives, right? We have all kinds of devices. They make noise, they flash, they buzz. Oh, oh was that, was that me? Was that, or, or was that, was that you? Was that you? <laughs> and our brains try to focus on this one thing, and then immediately we have to focus on something else. Neuroscientists say that there are fundamental and biological limits to what our brains can pay attention to at any one given time. There is no such thing as multitasking. It's true. Multiple studies have shown that multitasking, which is really doing one, more than one thing at a time, is a myth. People who think they can split their attention between multiple tax, tasks, they're not really getting more done but it's hard to resist. I got the blinking box, right? I have my inbox, I have the, the buzzing phone. What, what if it's important? And then there's social media. Studies say that 20-somethings can't go longer than two minutes without checking Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat or text or Instagram or Facebook. So tell me this, with all the interruptions and distractions, how in the world are people supposed to listen to and hear the voice of God? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Every two minutes. <laughs> Last week I talked about a great line from the Lord's Prayer. On earth as it is in heaven, right? And I thought today, well, let's look at another great line. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What a great prayer, right? <laughs> I need to pray the Lord's Prayer more, don't I? It's like the perfect prayer. It's like that Jesus guy really knew what he was talking about when he wrote that. Jesus puts temptation and evil in the same sentence. And then, wow, if I were to think about my biggest distraction, temptation. And don't worry, I'm not just singling you out. I mean, we all have them, even me. Turn to your neighbor and share your biggest temptation. I'm joking, don't do that. But it's not only our biggest distraction, I think temptation is also our biggest weakness. But like I said earlier, it seems like everything tempts me. I am so easily distracted, I'm like a, a dog when a deer runs by. So I personally, I have to live by, by very strict rules. For instance, if I'm on a diet, I don't cheat, ever. I, I know myself too well. I know that if I have a cheat day or a cheat meal, it's over. So just to yourself, think about it. What tempts you the most? 
And why is, why is it always there distracting you? If God is supposed to be the most important thing, then what would be that one thing that leads you away from God? During the Apostle Paul's ministry, Timothy became one of Paul's favorite companions, but there was a time when Timothy stayed behind in Ephesus while Paul went on ahead without him. So the book of Timothy is Paul's wisdom, Paul's guidance to Timothy while the two of them are apart. The city of Ephesus, where Timothy was staying, was so bad, the philosopher uh, Heraclitus, also known as the weeping philosopher, he once said, no one could live in Ephesus and not weep over its immorality. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Paul writes to him in the fourth chapter, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So he's saying people will go from one teacher to another. But that sounds innocent. And what Paul's talking about is not innocent. He's not saying, hey, you're going to go into one church and you're like, yeah, let's try a different church. And you go to a different church. He's not talking about that. The teacher here in this passage doesn't have to be a pastor. It could be an author. It could be a celebrity, right? Somebody with a talk show. It could be, it could be your group of friends. People are leading you away from sound teaching, Paul says. So that means right, that means moral, that means educated, that means logical. And because they want to hear what they want to hear, right, the people, they want to hear what they want to hear, Paul says they have, they have itching ears. They listen to voices that steer them away from God, steer them away from the truth. And that happens to all of us, doesn't it? It's, it's all part of the song, prone to wander, Lord, isn't it? It's part of the lead us not into temptation. We listen to other voices, not God's. Other voices say, it's okay to do that. Pff, the Bible is outdated. The, the God of the Bible is toxic. Why do we listen to those voices? Well, because we love ourselves and we love the world. Paul tells Timothy, we listen to false teachers because we love our own passions. He says in chapter 3, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. Notice the first thing he says. It brings all the rest. People who are lovers of self, right, who love themselves, what do they do? They covet, they boast, they're prideful, they're disobedient. Even Jesus says, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go, a father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self, can't be my disciple. Jesus tells us to love others at least as much as we do ourselves. We said a few weeks ago that loving others and being aware of other people and how our actions affect other people, that's a sign of maturity. Paul is able to write these things to Timothy because Paul has experienced these things firsthand. Paul willingly endured many hardships in his life because he loved the Lord and he loved others. Second reason we listen to false teachers, we love the world. 1 John 2 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes are the pride of life. And it is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world must make himself an enemy of God. Bottom line is, people hate God because they love the world. But as Christians, we are to set our affections on things above. We are to not place our affections on earth. The things above will last forever. The things of earth will pass away. We read last week that eventually all of this is going to go up in smoke, right? And so false teaching 
is always going to be around because it sounds sweet to the ear. It plays to our weaknesses. And this is why people are so willing to believe the wrong things all the time because it benefits them. It aligns with what they want. It flatters them. And it might sound right. It might sound true. So Paul steps out and he says, no, these are the wrong voices. And he says in verse 10, those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme. The glorious ones were as angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. He says, you know that voice that you're listening to, that other voice, the one that's not sound, the one that's not stable, or that, you know, that group of friends that despise authority? Who is authority? God. It could even be God's word. In other words, false teachers don't respect God. They don't respect his teaching. And that wasn't true a long time ago, was it? No. What, 50, 60 years ago? Back then, you only had a handful of authority figures. The authority figures that you listened to and that you obeyed were your parents, uh, teachers, the government, the police, and the Bible. That was probably it. Not anymore. Today, what do all those outside voices say? <laughs> what do your parents know? Your government, well, they're corrupt. They're all a bunch of liars. Police officers, they're hungry power bullies. They throw their weight around. They're tyrants. The Bible, <laughs> written by sexist men. It's all made up. Nobody would have said any of those things 50 years ago. Why not? Oh, it's because we're all smarter now. No, because we have new authorities. Who do we believe now? Television, news anchors, and social media. We're weighing all of the choices and we're basing everything that we think is right on new authorities. And what we're really doing is, when we do that, we are slowly making ourselves the authority. And we've never been that before. Well, we Google it first. Technically, right, we Google it, we Google it first, we read one article that we already agree with, <laughs> and then now we're the expert on the subject. Did you go to a library? Did you read a book? I mean, did you talk to somebody that has a degree in that field or works in that field? No, I just use common sense. I just use reason. I'm going with my feelings. Oh yeah? And then what conclusion did you arrive at? God is mean, he's judgy. The Bible is archaic, the Bible is outdated. The Bible is sexist. Christians think they're always right. And second Peter says, wow. You know, the angels are greater than you and they're more powerful than you and they would never dream of saying those things. Proverbs 28 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Paul says the angels hear you blaspheme God, and they don't even judge you. That's what he says. They don't even judge you because they know the judgment is reserved for God. Paul goes on in verse 12, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to re revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. They are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Yikes. <laughs> right? That's a lot to take in. 
I mean, we can break it all down line by line. This is Paul talking about false prophets, voices that lead us away. And the first thing he says is, these false teachers are like irrational animals. Why, why animals? Because animals act on urge. They act on instinct. They don't make decisions based on thought and reason, right? They don't weigh the differences. They just act on impulse. Hungry, eat. Hung sleepy, sleep. Bored, play. Paul says, false teachers are just like that. If it feels good, do it. If it sounds right, believe it. And he says, this teaching is blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. Paul says, you, you really are going to make all those claims about God? You're really going to say all those things about his church? You're really going to make those uh, arguments about his living word? You don't know what you're talking about. That means false teachers, they make bold and arrogant claims about God. And it might sound logical, but it is ignorant and it is offensive. He says they count pleasure to revel in the daytime. What does that mean? It means all the things that we used to not talk about, now we talk about. The things we used to hide from one another, now they're out in the daylight. Like our temptations, like our distractions, like our sins. They are now all out in the open. There's no shame. Look at these memes. Look at these memes I found. Thanks for airing all of your dirty laundry on Facebook so that you may then later whine about how people should stay out of your business. Here's the second one. Facebook is not a clothesline. Be a deer and air your dirty laundry elsewhere. And looks like you confuse Facebook with your diary again. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's their motto. It's their slogan. We're all admitting that it happens. The world doesn't hide it anymore. It's on television now. It used to be perfectly safe to watch television with your kids. Comedian George Carlin, back in 1972, he used to have a stand-up bit. It was called The Seven Words You Can't Say on TV. I have heard them all on TV. All those cuss words I hear on TV. My sons have heard those words on TV. Sin now revels in the daytime. But those false teachers, Paul says, they are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. First Corinthians says it like this, bad company corrupts good character. Paul says they are sitting at the dinner table with you, they got their arm around you, they're raising a glass, and they're pretending to be your friend and to have your best interests at hearts, but in reality, they are blots and blemishes. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. Those things that make us wander away. Those things that tempt us. Those things that entice us, distract us. Listen, and it, it, it doesn't have to be other religions or atheists or woke culture. The thing that is killing Christians today is that they love pleasure more than God. That we are missing out on the greatest pleasures that we could have by being with God. And it's sad, but these false teachers, they find people who are not solid, they're not grounded, they're not listening, they're easily distracted, and then it becomes so much simpler to pull them away. And Paul says they have hearts trained in greed. After all, what are temptations if not a love for self, a love for the world, and a love for money? 1 Timothy 6 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. If you love money, you will serve money. And when you serve money, you don't serve God. You can't serve one and the other. Nobody knows Scottish economist Adam Smith. Nobody knows him. But we all know his famous words. Money can't buy happiness. But do we believe it? The widow who gave her two pennies, she believed it. I know this is a tough one. And Paul knew it because notice he says we were trained in greed, right? We were trained in greed, which means what? 
It means that's how we were raised. The next one takes a little bit more explaining. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Now, the story of Balaam is found in Numbers, and he was a wicked prophet in the Bible. He was not a false prophet. God actually did speak to him. Balaam did hear from God. God gave Balaam true prophecies to speak, but Balaam's heart was not with God, and eventually he betrayed God's people. Balaam was asked by a king to curse Israel and to say that that curse came from God. And if he did it, this king would give him money, right? So he's going to take a bribe. Balaam took the bribe, and the next day, God sent an angel with a flaming sword to block Balaam's way. But Balaam couldn't see the angel, but the donkey he was riding could. And three times the donkey tried to move out of the way, and Balaam beat the donkey. And then God humiliates Balaam and says, all right, if you won't listen to me, maybe you will listen to this stupid donkey. And God made the donkey speak to him with a human voice. And the irony is, an irrational animal had more wisdom than God's prophet. And then to make Paul's point, false teachers would rather take a bribe, right? They would rather take money and do what's best for themselves than listen to God. And then he finishes with verse 17 saying, these are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm for them in gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. So yes, this is why being uh, with a false prophet or, or, or being a false prophet is bad, right? Because where do the false prophets go? Where does the love of the world and self and money take them? The gloom of utter darkness. So the hymn writer says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh, take and seal it with thy spirit from above. Lord, I am so easily tempted. I ignore you so easily. It's so easy to ignore the teachings of the Bible. It's so easy to only obey the parts I agree with. It's so easy to make the same choices the world makes. It's so easy to dress like everybody else, act like everybody else, fit in, be like-minded. Lord, I feel it. So help me, right? Help me. Take my heart and lock it up in a vault away from the world and away from me so that I can't reach it. God isn't going to do that. That's why we pray, lead me not into temptation. Because our heart will always be susceptible to temptation. So what do we do? How do we make sure that we're listening to the right voice? I want to read you a story. It's 1 Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called for me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel a third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy, and therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. What can we learn from the story about young Samuel hearing the Lord for the first time? First, Samuel is sleeping. That's not the part I want you to follow. <laughs> but it's where Samuel is sleeping. Did you notice? He's in the temple of the Lord, next to the ark. And you know, you know you, as you sat and listened to me talk, you know I love to pick up these little small details in the Bible, and I really think that this detail is interesting. Because the author could have just said sleeping, 
sure, right? But the author goes into detail about where is he sleeping? And, the, and it's so important because this is a sacred place. This temple, this is holy. And what strikes me is if we want to hear God and hear his voice, are we listening in those sacred places? I mean, sure, we could hear God anywhere. We can hear God everywhere. But do you have a sacred place? Do you have a space where you can be quiet and listen to God when he speaks? Is there a place in your home or at work, in traffic, wherever? Have you carved out a place and said, this is a sacred space? Samuel is close to God. And I think if you want to hear God when he speaks to you, we should be close. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I mean, we could preach an entire sermon series about that one passage, just those 11 words. Joanna and I, uh, my wife, we use the same logic at home. We do. I can yell at her from another room. The kids can yell at her from another room. And she can hear us, which I'm sure, I'm sure she can. She ignores us. And instead she yells back and she says, I can't hear you, I'm in another room. What's her point? Let's talk face to face. Let's talk without distractions, right? But let's say she and I are in the same room. I can still be distracted. If I'm on my computer or the TV's on, I can still hear her. Sometimes she's talking to me and because I'm task oriented and because I, I believe I can multitask, I start doing the dishes, which is near the tele television and that's on and then it's all going on at the same time. And I'm nodding my head and I'm saying, oh yeah, wow. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Tell me more. And you know, my head is bobbing up, up and down. But what I'm really thinking is, I bet I can figure all of this out later. Cut to last Tuesday, I asked Joanna, um, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow? Why? <laughs> Why does Joanna get frustrated with me? Same reason God gets frustrated with me. I don't listen. I'm prone to wander. I'm led away to temptation. Find a sacred space so you can have a private moment of listening of worshiping God. It means we sit still, we stand or lay down, whatever position works for you, hands folded, hands open, hands raised, eyes open, eyes closed, none of it matters to God as long as we're talking to him and listening to him. It's important to spend quality time with God. But David, wasn't Samuel asleep? <laughs> Good point. But notice that God wakes him up three times, right? Does anybody like to be woken up? Not me. I enjoy my sleep. But what I learned from this is sometimes God is talking to us at an inconvenient time. It's not always on our timing, it's his timing. God calls us to do things which don't always fit our agenda, fit our schedule, fit our idea of how it should be done. So remember, God may be speaking at any time, even during the night. And it means we need to take time to listen and respond to his calling. And, and Samuel does respond, doesn't he? We forget that, but he says, speak for your servant hears. And that might sound a little strange because, you know, I don't, I don't need to give God permission to speak. But I do need to show God that I am ready to listen. How often do we call God for help or answers and then we don't wait for an answer? We need to tell God, speak, and I am ready to listen. I want to listen. We try listening to God but we become so absorbed in all the distractions and we end up not really hearing or not really listening to what God is telling us. And just like God tells the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. If you are prone to wander, if you're tempted or distracted, I would just ask, are you near God? And do you have a sacred space where you can listen to God? Are you open to God's timing? over your own timing? Are you giving God permission to speak to you? Are you ready to listen to him? 
So this may be strange, but just while you're sitting there and I'm here, I want you to quietly pray to God. I'll still be here. You can just listen to my voice. And I want you to begin with, speak, for your servant hears. And then just listen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy grace. Lord, I know my heart, and it is prone to wander. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. Help me to listen to your voice in the morning, in the noon time, and when I go to sleep. I want to be yours every day of my life. I want to listen to your voice and not the outside voices. I want to listen to your true prophets and not the false ones. I want to listen to the true authority, and not the false ones. I want to be led by your teaching and your guidance and your governance. To be called a son of God. To be called a daughter of God. To be called a child of God. May I, with my friends, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, may we learn to listen. May we learn to obey. May we learn to discern truth from falsehood, fact from fiction, love from hate, mercy and grace from judgment. Show me where my sacred places are. Help me to be aware of your timing. Lord, I'm always willing to listen. Awaken me, even if I am asleep. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Thanks for listening to this message. Of course, you can always clip and copy the URL up there and post it to your own Facebook page or your own social media and let other people know what you listened to this morning. And we want you here. We want you here with us. We love you and we want to spend our Sunday mornings with you. Uh, we have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We have a choir, we sing hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer, do responsive readings, have communion. It's going to feel like the church that you grew up in. And then we have an 11 o'clock service. We have a worship team. Please come casual, come as you feel comfortable. We also have a full children's program during that hour from birth all the way through high school. And we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.